to the French Connections Thursday edition. Today is the 11th day of May 2006. My name is Daryl Bradford Smith, and it's great to have you here on another broadcast of this, uh, this most important of shows, the, the French Connection. Uh, I am the witness.com is the website, and I am the witness at hotmail.com is the connection, uh, the connection to me. We, uh, we, as, as usual, we, uh, we always try to find really important interviews to try to forward the research that we do on the French Connection. Uh, and we also work on many other subjects, as you also know. But this, this particular subject has a lot of twists and turns in it. Uh, the, my guest today that we're going to be talking with, uh, Christopher Bolin, has looked into many of the anomalies that 9-11 uh, has, has brought forward. I mean, we've, we've seen things about Logan Airport in question. We've seen things about the 93 in question. Of course, the buildings themselves coming down and, and, and how that was all done. All of these things are stink terrible, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And, and what we're going to do today is bring up a new uh, a new item. Actually, it's been posed before, but I don't think anybody has looked into it quite the way Christopher Bolin has in this most recent article he's going to be publishing on uh, American Free Press. So let's bring him up right now and, and talk to Christopher. Chris, are you with me? Yeah, hi. Can you hear me all right? I sure do, Chris. Uh, how are you? Good, thank you. How are you? Pretty good, pretty good. You know, the last time we, we, we worked on some stuff, we discussed uh, um, this, the um, airfield north of, of uh, Stewart Air Base. We discussed the the convergence of the planes from Logan over that airfield, and uh, we discussed some of those facts last time we, we we were on with me. Yeah, yeah, we have. We've talked about Stewart Air Force Base and and the security at Logan Airport, the lack of security. Mm-hmm. Well, what, what was the uh, what was the the airfield's um, contract with? What Israeli company was was working out of Logan? That was a company called Huntley USA Corporation, which is a, a wholly owned subsidiary of a company uh, formerly known as uh, Interna- International Consultants on Targeted Security, or mm-hmm. ICTS, which is, in, which is a, a Mossad company uh, uh, based of you know, Israelis who, who have had long careers in Israeli military intelligence, and they based their company for international uh, providing security at airports. They're based out of Amsterdam and Holland. Well, they are at Stubble Airport. They're also at Gatwick, from what I understand, and they and they have they have uh, other air, uh, airports in America, don't they? Including uh, the one that we're going to discuss today over in Cleveland. Well, I, uh, that's a good question about Cleveland. I haven't checked that, but they were they did provide security at uh, Newark uh, Newark Airport and also at Boston Logan on 9/11. Mm-hmm. Um, they they provide security at a lot of airports. That's interesting. I I haven't looked into that about the Cleveland Airport yet. Well, what we do know is that uh, there were some very strange, um, strange behaviors of these of these aircraft that kind of converged over Stewart, and we're going to re- revisit this for a second because I'd like to use this this particular um, anomaly to bring us into the next one. Uh, we, we had those Logan flights kind of crisscrossing over over the Stewart Air Force Base, didn't we? Yeah, they converged uh, both 175, flight, flight 175 and 11. The two planes that hit the World Trade Center, they converged over Stewart Air Force Base, uh, former Stewart Air Force Base. Now it's uh, um, it's Stewart International Airport, and it is the only privately owned airport in the United States. Um, and and this is only 60 miles north of the World Trade Center. So this is all within the New York metro area. And what 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 may have happened um, is that these two planes, if we if we if we use the Operation Northwood scenario, these two planes may have landed at Stewart International Airport, which is in Westchester County, and drones may have taken taken up their flight paths and continued the flight to the World Trade Center. 
Well, that's not a big leap of faith. And, and in fact, weren't there some people instrumental in, in the privatization from the uh, Port Authority of the World Trade Center and the uh, Stewart Air Force Base, Very some good. of the same characters? Very good point. Very good point. The person behind the privatization of, West, of the airport, the Stewart Air Force Base, and the World Trade Center, the, the architect of all this is Ronald Lauder. And he's a, he's a son of Estee Lauder, the big cosmetics company in New York. Um, and, and he was a part, he was the director of the governor's privatization board. And he pushed for the privatization of the World Trade Center and of this airfield, um, in the year 2000. And the airfield, the Stewart Air Force Base was privatized earlier than the World Trade Center. As you know, the World Trade Center only became actually privately held property on July 26th of 2001. Yeah. And yeah. The, person, the person that was in charge of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey at the time was Louis Eisenberg. Um, he's, a, he's the former head of the United Jewish Appeal, and he is the person who oversaw the negotiations which delivered the lease, the 99-year lease, into the hands of Larry Silverstein. Well, now, it's interesting to note uh, that Mr. Silverstein, uh, prior to his ownership of that building, was a, uh, a strip bar owner over in, in Brooklyn of a place called Runway 99. Now, how a man goes from owning strip, uh, strip clubs mm -hmm. to uh, being in charge of a billion, uh, several billion dollar building is anybody's guess, but, uh, but I would say that there's a lot more to that story that we need to uncover. But well, he was also named in a lawsuit in which, uh, in which uh, Bill Clinton was also named regarding the uh, smuggling of drugs into the United States, the, the whole MENA, Arkansas drug smuggling ring. Um, there was a lawsuit brought by, I think it was a former Marine, uh, which was thrown out, but uh, uh, in this lawsuit, uh, uh, Larry Silverstein was named as being um, involved in this drug smuggling operation. Well, no surprises there again. And now here's the interesting thing about Ron Lauder, uh, and in, including uh, Mark Rich as well. Both of these men uh, have, have been hovering around this deal, and both of them have a very close connection to Herzliya, where there's a mm -hmm. university structure for preparing people to go into the Mossad, isn't there? Uh, yeah, it's, you would call it, I think you would call it Mossad University. It's in Herzliya, which is where the Mossad has their headquarters, north of Tel Aviv, and it's called the Interdisciplinary Center, the IDC. And uh, both, like you said, Mr. Rich and Ronald Lauder have donated uh, funds to the school, and they have colleges or schools in their name. Um, Ronald Lauder has a school for strategy and government, I think it is, and the Mark Rich has a school for uh, you know financial transactions. And yeah, and the thing is, is that the the, the head of the school, the dean of the school, is is a, a former uh, you know director of the Mossad. CIA is, is involved in all this, and CIA this, CIA that. What, what I've found over, over my uh, time investigating this, the CIA pretty much is kind of gutted these days, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's, it's more of a paper-pushing organization. What I found is most of these uh, relationships that go back to the Mossad are done with the Department of Defense and the Pentagon, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you can see that with Fife and, and, and Libby and, and all the rest of them, and m much of their planning, it seems, with the Mossad goes through that organization rather than the CIA. Am I correct in making yeah, that Yeah, I, I think you're right through the, yeah, you're right, and also Department of State. And, and what's interesting is that what I have found, I mean, I've been researching 9-11 for, since it happened. And uh, like on this recent story I did about Cleveland, I was just looking at the evidence and the people involved, and there suddenly it popped up this key player who is a very, very high Zionist in the United States, a guy named Sam Miller. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and he is actually the father of Aaron Miller, 
who was the senior policy advisor on the Middle East for four administrations at the Department of State. And, and he's the father of Aaron Miller. So, I mean, it's like it's a very small network of people. But what I have found at every critical juncture of 9-11, whether it's the investigation, the destruction of the evidence, um, the, the mysteries at Cleveland Airport, what have you, I eventually find that the person, the key person who was the gatekeeper or the, the person who, who made the key decision is a, very, is a Zionist with close ties to Israel. Now, this is not a coincidence. No, I, well, I, it, it's, it's not a coincidence that uh, some of the facilities were co-leased up in Stewart and co-leased over at the Cleveland uh, to government agencies. Am I wrong in saying that? No, no, you're, you're right. I mean, in Cleveland, you know, these two planes landed. One was reported to have been Flight 93, which supposedly crashed in, in Shanksville. But in this case... The, the reports are very clear that the passengers were taken off the plane and taken into the NASA facility. And this was when the entire airport had been shut down. And, and there in the NASA facility, these passengers were interrogated or interviewed by the FBI. Now, this doesn't make any sense. If this plane just had a, a, bom had a bomb scare and they landed the plane at Cleveland just to get the people off the plane, why were they taken to a NASA facility and why were FBI agents waiting for them there? It doesn't make a lot of sense. No, it doesn't. And I also understand that Stewart had uh, something rather odd at the end of its runway that was rather uh, uh, a building that was rather clandestinely uh, kind of uh, installed over there, a big hangar bay. Yeah, no, what's interesting about, about, about that airport, um, Stewart International Airport, which is owned by a, a British company that has its base in Texas, in Houston, I believe, um, it, that that airport was privatized, like I said, in 2000, in early 2000. But after it was privatized and turned over to pri a private company from Britain, Congress voted to give it millions and millions of dollars to build a new air traffic control system, a new control tower, and new hangars. And you have to ask yourself, what kind of privatization was this? Well, it seems like a, a sweetheart of a deal to me. Very now. much so. Well, you know, here's where where we start going into the into the other uh, workings here. Uh, this plane supposedly 93 was full of of uh, well American citizens and foreign travelers. Or I don't know the, the passenger list, but from what I understand, if they were deplaned there, or, or if these these passengers existed at all, uh, they had to do something with them, and and so. Basically, either they either either they did actually hit the building, which we have a lot of evidence that says that's questionable, or they had to get rid of these people after the fact. And this is this is a painful thought to even consider, isn't it? Yeah. So so where does your evidence lead you? What what do you got on this story? Well, the thing is, is that um, uh, the, the Cleveland Airport, Cleveland Hopkins Airport, was under the control of the mayor of Cleveland. His name was um, Michael White. And he's a black man who was under the control. This is all based on the reports from the Cleveland newspapers because uh, Mayor White in the year 2005, his right-hand man, a guy named Nate Gray, his closest friend, his best man at two of his weddings, and uh, his business associate was uh, convicted of 36 counts of bribery, uh, racketeering, and, and things uh, like that um, involving um, activities in four different um, cities. Well... When Nate Gray was convicted, then um, it became clear to the people of uh, Cleveland that uh, Mayor White was, uh, was probably, uh, had headed the most corrupt administration in the history of Cleveland. Now, the thing is, is that this didn't happen by itself. Um, this mayor became the mayor because of the financial support of Samuel Miller, who is the, uh, the co-chairman of the company Forest City Enterprises, which is a huge real estate company. Uh, they, 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 for example, they manage the housing projects where the um, U.S. Navy people live, like Great Lakes Naval, Naval Base, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and and they, own, they own properties from the East Coast to the West Coast and all in between. Now, every week, Nate Gray, the man who was convicted of 36 counts of bribery, and, and the mayor, Mayor White, and Sam Miller, they would have dinner at a very fancy hotel in Cleveland. And in this trial, in this, in this uh, uh, grand jury case, um, one of the co-defendants revealed that, that Gray told him that um, Sam Miller basically ran the mayor and ran the city. Now, this is important because they closed, the, the mayor, White, closed Cleveland Airport. He ordered it evacuated at 10 o'clock in the morning. 
Yeah. And all of the people were told that they had to leave but not take their cars. So these people had to walk out to the highway to try and get a taxi or get a ride to town to find a place to stay. And this meant that people, thousands of people, were evacuated from the airport. And then at 10.45, one plane landed, and uh, shortly later, another plane landed. These planes were both identified as having been uh, sabotaged with bombs. The Associated Press reported that one of the planes was Flight 93. And what's interesting in this very short article from the Associated Press is that the... um, the spokesperson for United Airlines confirmed to the Associated Press that this was Flight 93. This plane was disembarked, and, and there, there, there are some, there are some as, as these stories become confused over, over the next period, couple days, um, it appears that we're getting reports from two different planes. The other yeah. plane was Delta um, 1989, which notably came from Boston's Logan Airport. And, it, and the, the early reports from the, uh, the newspapers in Dayton and Cleveland or, or in Akron, Ohio, indicate that the mayor said that the first plane landed and 200 people were taken off the plane. And these 200 people were taken into the NASA facility or in another report they were taken to the FAA facility. But in any case, we have uh, what appear to be two planes landing at the airport. One's Flight 93, one's Delta 1989, and the people are offloaded and interrogated by FBI agents in um, a NASA facility. Now, uh, how does that square? I mean, there, there had to be people who survived these interrogations. Have any come forward? There have been some reports uh, uh, on, online from some of the people who were um, on Delta 1989, I, I believe it is, and and these there are some reports, but again these are um, somewhat anonymous reports, you know, where the names aren't given and things like that. So we 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 don't have a lot of um, evidence as to what happened to these people, which is why I called up the mayor of Cleveland yesterday. Now mm-hmm. it's interesting that after this whole case went through and and his his business associate was convicted of 36 counts of uh, bribery, the mayor, um, the former mayor, Mayor White retired onto his 45-acre alpaca farm where he raises these uh, llamas. Mm-hmm. And um, that's in, in, in uh, central Ohio, a few, you know, 60 miles, I think, south of Cleveland. And I called him up and I asked him, you know, you know if he could tell me anything to clarify these, what happened at the airport. Um, because he's the person, he's the source of the information in these articles that I was talking about. He gave a yeah. press conference. Yeah. And he says... Um, I'm no longer in the in the in the business of giving interviews, something to that effect. And he basically hung up the phone. So then I called up the uh, Sam Miller, who was you know his uh, his supporter, and asked him uh, what he knew about what happened at Cleveland Airport that day. And um, you know this is this is a man who has enormous influence in the city of Cleveland. And he told me he says I don't know nothing about it. He doesn't know nothing about anything at the Cleveland Airport that day. And when I asked him, well, you know, can you tell me what kind of relationship you had with the mayor at that time? He said, what business is that of yours? And I told him, well, I'm a journalist. I'm looking into this. And he said, I don't know nothing about it. And he hung up the phone. So it's, it's, a, it's a very... And, and what's interesting about Sam Miller is that he is the father of Aaron Miller, who, right. is, who is a State Department official who has basically written, you know, the Oslo Accord and, and United States Middle Eastern policy for the last four administrations. Well, he, here's where it gets interesting. Okay. Well, you also uh, made a little visit to Shanksville. Yes. And you discussed uh, the what, what the area residents uh, saw that day. And there were some very strange uh, discrepancies in the in the official story that you found. You want to go into some, some of yeah. those discoveries? Yeah, very very much so. Um, you know, the the, the the fundamental inconsistency with the official version is that at the crash site, the hole in the ground is only about 20 feet across, mm-hmm. and it's about five or six feet deep. And I spoke to a a, a woman who ran up to the smoking hole. Um, immediately after the explosion or whatever caused that hole. And um, she told me that it sounded like a tremendous explosion, like an atomic bomb, she even said. And she was working only a few hundred meters away when, when, that, when that happened. But when she ran up to the hole, which she said was about 20 feet across and 5 feet deep, she said there was no evidence of an airplane there. Um, there was no pieces of anything. And, and, and this, is the, this is the fundamental discrepancy. I mean, how can a, a large jetliner 
full of people and passengers and luggage, what have you, disappear into a 20-foot hole and leave no trace of itself behind. Well, not only that, after the fact, they put armed, the, the FBI was on the site almost immediately, right. and so was the FAA and the rest of them. They, I mean, they were, they were already waiting for this crash to happen at that place, it seems. And what they did is they cordoned off the area at, and put armed guards there and allowed no rescuers to go and, and sift through the area. And that's what, that's what Wally Miller said. You know, he was the coroner there, and the coroner is supposed to have, in the state of Pennsylvania, the coroner is supposed to have jurisdiction over the crash site or the death site. And he said that uh, he stopped being a coroner after 10 minutes because there were no bodies there. And, 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 you know, this is the thing, is that this, this is a fundamental discrepancy, that there's no evidence. The FBI then told Wally Miller that, you know, they basically said, are you going to play, play ball with us or not? And he had to agree to turn over the site to the FBI. Now, this is important because um, whatever bodies they supposedly retrieved from this crash site, um, the, the local papers reported that they recovered, that they said that they had recovered 10% of the body parts and 90% of the plane. And, and these, from this 10% of the body parts that they supposedly recovered, these were all taken by the FBI to the Dover Air Force Base where the DNA analysis was done. And they identified who these 40, and they identified all 40 people on the plane, supposedly, right? Now, and, how could they do that without family DNA to match it to? Well, this, the, what we understand is that the FBI went to the houses of the relatives and things and asked for DNA samples. That's the, the explanation, is that they, they obtained DNA evidence from um, the families. Well, that, that's, a, that's an investigation yet to happen, I'm sure. Right. But the thing is, is that then they turned around and sent to Wally Miller as the coroner for Somerset County. They sent these 40 death certificates, which he signed off on. And I called him up, uh, because I know Wally Miller, and I said, you know, Wally, you, you, this doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. You signed off on the death certificates of 40 individuals whose bodies you never saw. And when... He became very upset with that um, because it really, he, he really did abdicate his authority to the FBI. And, and uh, what's interesting is that both Wally Miller and the local paper, which never reported any of this, um, seem to have come into some money immediately after 9-11 because they both have made extensive renovations or built new buildings after 9-1-1. And this is a very small town. The Somerset Tribune, I think it's called, um, has a $2 million building, which they built in 2002 or 2003, and it only has a circulation of 14,000 readers. And, and this paper has never asked, interviewed any of the eyewitnesses who saw these military planes flying around or who, who saw these or screeching missiles or, 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 or heard these tremendous explosions. These people, like Lee Perbaugh and, and um, Lena... Lensbauer were never interviewed by, or, 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 or Sheila McElwain, I think is her name, the woman who saw the, the Thunderbolt plane, the A-10 Thunderbolt, screaming over her car before any explosion. So we have evidence of this military planes flying in circles, these uh, close combat planes known as warthogs. Yeah. We have evidence of them flying around, eyewitnesses seeing these planes flying in circles around the crash site before any crash occurred. And, and, and this doesn't make any sense, but because this paper did not interview any of these witnesses, and there are scores of them, um, they apparently did the right thing and came into a lot of money. Uh, and now let's talk about the FBI for a minute here. It seems to be the, the uh, police uh, authority that is most corrupted in all of these investigations. If you go back 
to uh, to looking into Oklahoma City. If you go back uh, and and look at, at Bill Clinton's MENA, and you look at all of the uh, the machinations in Washington D.C. over the last twenty years, right? Uh, it seems like the FBI is the one that is the most corrupted. And, yeah, and, and there's no question about it. And I think that that occurred at the top. You know, the Department of Justice has has had a cabal of of uh, very powerful Zionists running it. Um, going back 30 years or so, I mean, there was Abraham Sofayer um, back in the Reagan administration time, I think it was, and, and during Bush, Bush father's period. And, and now we, we, then during the time of, of 9-11, we had um, Michael Chertoff at a, at a key position, you know, in charge of criminal, the criminal division of the Department of Justice. Um, and, and he is a, a dual national, an Israeli-American whose mother was one of the first Mossad agents in the state of Israel. So with those kind of people at the very top, you, you remember at 9-11 we had a brand new director of the FBI, brand new director, uh, Mr. Mueller. And That's he was right. only on the job for less than a week. And so when I checked into it you know, and asked, well, who was making these decisions at the Department of Justice you know, and guiding this investigation of 9-11, I was told it was Michael Chertoff. Well, and, and, and you know, Michael Chertoff's also the gentleman that went up to uh, upstate New York uh, and, and got, a, uh, got a, a pedophile charge sealed on, uh, on Scott Ritter. Right. So, I mean, you know, when, when we start looking around at this stuff, it, they're, they're, it's always the same faces or the people in the same group here. Right, now, and they, they keep popping up, and they're not, you know, they, they are not um, tied to the Vatican. So they're not tied to the Opus Dei. I mean, all of the people that I have found are, are neither Jesuits nor Catholics. The people who are in the key position that I have found, like Michael Sheratoff, like Sam Miller, um, like Alan Ratner, um, who, who was involved in the selling of the like, steel. Like Clay Dean, like, like they Lord, are, Lord. They are They are, on the contrary to being uh, Jesuits, they are Zionists, and what we call warm, warm Zionists or warm Jews. That is that they are active supporters of the state of Israel. Like Sam Miller, who I told you about, he is the national chairman of the United Jewish Appeal, which is the largest Zionist organization in the United States, collecting money and giving support to the state of Israel. And that, Larry Silverstein, the leaseholder of the World Trade Center, was also in a former leadership position at the United Jewish Appeal, as was Louis, Louis, um, uh, Louis Eisenberg, who, who oversaw the privatization of the World Trade Center, giving it. So what we find is we find Zionists, Jewish Zionists, at every key checkpoint, at every key juncture of the 9-11 saga. And, and you'll, find, you'll, you'll find them in our investigative um, uh, areas as Michael well as FBI, uh, Yeah. Michael Sheraton is a good example. I mean, we had, you know, according to Carl Cameron and also articles in American Free Press, um, going back long before, um, but we, we, we find that there were, in fact, at least 200 um, Israeli agents who had been involved in either, either um, uh, eavesdropping, snooping on these uh, 19 Arabs, or like the 60 movers who, who were involved in clearly having driven vans with explosives, with box cutters, and celebrating the collapse of the World Trade Center, videotaping, what have you, like the five guys arrested in Jersey City. Right. These, these people were all taken into custody and held, and even you know, given lie detector tests, which they failed, and, and then, though, rather than being, you know, um, sent to Guantanamo or anything like that, they were sent back to Israel um, at taxpayers' expense on simple visa violations. While at the same time, Sheratov rounded up like 800 Muslim people and Arabs and said, here are your terrorist suspects. And it turned out, of course, that all of those 800 or 900 Arabs they rounded up were all let go, and they had, they had no involvement in terrorism. Chertoff, Chertoff was also the chief uh, investigator on the first World Trade Center bombing back in 93. Exactly, and that's the key point. Chertoff, as a, I think he was a district attorney or attorney general in, in the state of New Jersey, um, like you said, he managed and oversaw that, that legal process that resulted in which these uh, um, uh, Judas goats, these, these agents, these Zionist agents and people um, who were in paid informants. I mean, I think his name was Ahmad Salem, was the, was the, uh, uh, the FBI informant mm -hmm. who was central to the entire 1993 bombing. He was yep. paid a million dollars by the FBI to be an informant. I mean, that's an incredible amount of money to give an Egyptian fella to, uh, you know, uh, play a role in a, in a, in a, in a fake-type 
you know, bombing scenario. And and what I what I think is that is that you know there's there are books about um, this kind of thing, but. The, the 1993 bombing and the Oklahoma City bombing, in which the FBI was very closely involved in both, these were meant to sort of prime the pump for 9-11 so yeah. that Americans would get used to the idea that, there, there, that terrorism is a fact of life and is a danger and a threat to them. So that when 9-11 happened, it didn't come out of the blue. They could say, well, look, at we, you know, this is what they finally, they finally made good on their, on their threats. That's right. That's right. Well, and, and, and I happen to know that there are other connections to this particular group and the Pentagon. And, uh, of course, I, I've had uh, Karen Kwiatkowski, Lieutenant Colonel, on where she said uh, they, that Douglas Faith and, and Scooter Libby and the, and the rest of these, uh, and they are all uh, diehard neocon Zionists. And uh, I say neocon Zionists because I want to make the connection to what the mainstream press calls them and what we know them as. Right. The fact is neocon Zionists were involved in the control of, uh, very important control points of of this. Um, what was this uh, spy scandal here in within the Pentagon? There, the um, uh, for Larry Franklin mm-hmm. and this Franklin uh, spy scandal. And of course, they, these same names came up with the Pollard case. Well, the point the point we're trying to make here is that the organs of, of control, power, and expression are either FBI, Pentagon, or Justice Department, and then the White House. And then, of course, when you want to look at acquiescing to all these crimes, we can start looking over at the Congress being bought and paid for and having political pressure made by uh, Benai Birth ADL, by um, Southern Poverty Law, by the, the right. um, p- People for the American Way. All of these organizations right. place, place their pressures on Congress uh, to either turn a blind eye or to participate. And when you and when you challenge that, like uh, Senator Paul Wellstone uh, from Minnesota, when you when you stand in the way of that of that uh, bulldozer um, of the neocons, like he did, um, you know he was he was killed in a very mysterious plane crash in in uh, upstate Minnesota, um, and the FBI agents were apparently on their way to that crash site before his plane even crashed. They had driven up from the Twin Cities, and they were on the way while his plane was still in the air, as if they anticipated his crash. Well, you know, and you can take a look at certain hot spots in the country for their control. Um, Cleveland looks like one of them. Absolutely. Um, uh, uh, Minnesota is another big hot spot for, for child pornography, child sex slavery, yes. as, well as, uh, as well as political uh, Zionist control. You can take a look at Los Angeles area, you can take a look at Miami area, and the New York region. Absolutely. These are areas, these are areas of the country that have been uh, peppered with, uh, you know, with extortion and, and bribery and and all kinds of control so that they have a good home base to, to nest themselves in. They're in charge of what I call, or some people have called, the, the concentration camp of the mind, and that is the media. Yeah. And in New York, it's particularly a tight media, um, you know, screaming at the New Yorkers um, all kinds of nonsense and, and, and half-truths and lies. But in the, in the United States as a whole, the, the media is um, uh, largely Zionist-controlled. There are very few voices like yours, like yours that, that, that are able to break through in, through the cracks in that, in that establishment. And, and this is why this, uh, what, what we call the fantasy version of 9-11, like this recent film, United 93, these, these um, voices are the loudest. And, and this movie, you know, now, it's only now four years after 9-11, but the mainstream media is now engaging itself in what the events of 9-11. And so we're getting mainstream, main, what I call the mainstream 9-11 voices. And these mainstream 9-11 voices are being heard in the mainstream media, on CNN, for example. But what these mainstream media voices do is they completely ignore the abundance of evidence that points to um, Israeli involvement, in, in September 11th. What they point to instead is that they want to put all the attention on somebody like Bush and Cheney, you know, being a political year. They want to put the blame on the White House and say, well, you know, 9-11 was crafted in the, in the Republican Party, so if we just have a change of party here and get the Democrats in, our troubles will be over. That's right. That's right. And, and you know, Eric and I, we, we, five, six weeks ago, seven now, when, when Alex Jones came out with this, uh, this, uh, uh, Charlie Sheen nonsense 
uh, we knew right away what this was about. This was going to be uh, a little show, a little show and tell for everybody that uh, Charlie was going to come out, become a, a short period hero, uh, be, be, you know, be wonderfully received in, 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 uh, in a lot of communities around the country who are very angry, mm -hmm. and then they were going to pull the rug out from under his credibility. Right. We saw this. We saw this the day he was he came out. The day he came out, we wrote an article the following day, mm -hmm. and boy, if we were not uh, uh, proven absolutely Absolutely spot on the money. Right, right, and and that's I think that's what they call like a, a limited hangout type thing that they let a little bit of the the truth come out, and and in the case of Charlie Sheen, like you said, they then they destroy his credibility afterwards. But um, this is what's going on with the whole 9/11 movement. It's 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 they're gonna let they're gonna let a little bit of truth out in order to entice that that huge percentage of the population that is absolutely um, you know demanding answers. Now, the United States, as I've been saying for years, is is being controlled by a crimeocracy. And, yeah. and this is a this is a the people who you know they have corrupted our voting system so that we have no oversight of elections anymore. So this system of of fraudulent voting brings into power these criminal networks, and and that is where the control all begins. And when you have a crimeocracy running the United States and waging illegal wars and and allowing mass murder to happen in New York City without being properly investigated, um, I don't see how the country can prosper. They can't, and, and, and here's, the, here's the most powerful thing. There, is, there are precedents for their actions. I mean, look at the liberty, and look at how they squashed any, any uh, um, investigation into the USS Liberty. Or take a look at the Levon affair. Of course, it was reported, but it didn't get any legs because uh, the mainstream media certainly didn't latch on to that or the liberty. It didn't latch on to the fact that Abu Nidal has direct ties to the Mossad. It doesn't latch on to a, a lot of the facts that we've been able to uncover over time. And the simple truth of the matter is it, it never will get traction unless we, unless we move away from from the mainstream media, and people start finding a, a separate source. Now, we're also under control on, on our Internet. I mean, look, uh, you know, Murdoch's got my MySpace thing. I got a MySpace account with a, with a few hundred people on it. But, uh, but look, at, look at MSN. I mean, they can look into my emails if they want to, Christopher. Right. Uh, they can hear my phone call right now with, uh, with Echelon. They, they know what we're doing. The fact is we're, we're controlled in, in every single communication means that they want to put on us. That's right, and and yeah, the the computer has centralized all this to, a, and and that's a very good point you raised. You know, we've been writing American Free Press has been writing for years about the way, um, not only the Inslaw case, but but also the way that uh, Amdocs, an Israeli company, handles all the billing for telephone calls in the United States, and 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 you know you have to ask yourself why is this kind of communications data. Um, being outsourced to an Israeli company. And, and then, um, you know, what I found in this whole 9-11 investigation, what have you, and also from the voting thing, is that a company like Unisys, a huge company like Unisys, which provides the uh, computer software and hardware for basically the entire U.S. government, they have been running Israeli security software. They have integrated Israeli security software coming from... What's the, the name of that? Give the name out. The, Unisys is the main company. Yeah, yeah. but the P, the, it's and called the P -Tech. Checkpoint. Well, no, the, that's a, P -Tech is a different. P -Tech is a different one out of out of Quincy, Massachusetts, um, involved in 9/11. But the, it's it's Checkpoint, Checkpoint Software, and that's out of Redwood City, California. But their main office is in Herzliya, Israel, or Tel Aviv, and and it's a it's a Mossad company. It's a, you see what the Mossad does is they have venture capital and they they create these computer companies, software companies. Um, Often computer security companies, just like their airport security companies, then they then they they sell this. They set up a branch in the United States, and because of their network, they're able to they're able to penetrate the U.S. government at the highest level and get this software through Unisys. I mean, Unisys. The head of Unisys is a guy named Larry Weinbach, and he's a he's a supporter of Israel, and he is the person who who brought Checkpoint software and other Israeli software programs and software, and he integrated them into the Unisys software.
Paul Bradford Smith. I am with you today for the next hour and 50 minutes. Great to have you here with me on the French Connection. We are doing a live and direct broadcast from central France on this, the uh, 22nd day of uh, December 2005. It is a, uh, it's a great day to be fighting the bad guys, ladies and gentlemen, because we are going to really punch these folks hard today. We have Lieutenant Commander Jim Anuff coming on at the second hour. Jim Anuff was, uh, he was the commander on the bridge of the USS Liberty while being attacked by the Israelis, ladies and gentlemen. He was there throughout the attack. We're going to bring him on. He's going to do about a half hour with us in the second hour. And before that, at the bottom of this hour, we're going to talk to Wayne Kyle, also a USS Liberty researcher and on the USS America, CV-66 an aircraft carrier that was not very far from the Liberty on that uh, fateful day that the Israelis uh, tried to murder our servicemen. Uh, this is not a new event, ladies and gentlemen. They murdered our people on 9-11. That's what they did. And they danced a jig while it happened. And they sent art students, uh, disguised art students who were actually Mossad agents, and they were found with bomb residue in their vans, ladies and gentlemen. This was an inside job done by Israel against the American public. <clears throat> Excuse me, the person that I brought on today, uh, his, his name is uh, Wayne Kyle. He was on the, uh, the USS America CV-66. It's an aircraft carrier. Uh, how do I know CV-66? I was also a sailor on that same ship, which uh, makes, uh, makes me a shipmate with this man, and uh, I couldn't be prouder. Uh, to make that statement, Wayne. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Wayne Kyle, uh, nice to have you here, Wayne. How are you? I'm, I'm great, uh, Daryl, and the feeling is mutual. I'm proud to have uh, served on that ship also. And, uh, well, we weren't shipmates at the same time, but we both served on the same ship, and today that ship is no longer with us. It's, uh, it's uh, part of history, so to speak, at the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> well, isn't it bizarre that they, they sunk the USS America? And well, it seems to yeah. me uh, almost like a, it seems to me like a uh, like a statement they were making. Yeah, I, I think so. And I'm only I'm o I'm just waiting to see what's going what what is going to be the fate of the USS Saratoga. Well, Saratoga. but I mean the, the Saratoga didn't didn't bear the name of our of our continent, you know. And, and no, that's and, right. You're right. And, there. and the fact is, this is kind of like sinking our name our namesake. But but here it is. Exactly. We're going to bring we're going to bring the commander on later as well for a short time. He's going to be able to do a little bit of time with us. But let's start right in on this, uh, Wayne. You want to set up the audience to let them know what, what kind of things happened that day? Well, let's see. On that day in 1967, we had we were already uh, we were already kind of placed in an alert status. Uh, our our port call at Toulon, uh, Can France had been canceled, and we were told. That was because things were heating up in the eastern Mediterranean area between uh, the Israelis and the Arabs, and we were going to be uh, continuing uh, or carrying on operations in, in that area. And at the time of the Liberty attack, we were operating with a two-carrier task force, that meaning uh, two aircraft carriers, the USS America and the USS Saratoga, about uh, 40 miles south of the island of Crete. Uh, the the uh, USS America was alerted that uh, one of its uh, one of its vessels, its navy ships, was under attack um, by un unnamed attackers at the moment. Or did, or did they, as far as you know today, did they name the attackers when they reported it, or did they say they were unnamed? When uh, when who reported it? The USS well, Liberty. Well, I mean, the, uh, the Liberty must have put out a, a call for help. Yes, they did. They sent out a distress call on the. Uh, uh, First of all, all of their all of their ship to shore circuits were blocked by uh, Israeli fighters who were using uh, radio jamming jamming techniques, buzzsaw jamming. Yep, yep. And uh, they even they even jammed the international distress frequency, which uh, there's some questions about whether that's considered a war crime or not, and we can get into that later. And Jim will probably talk about that. But um, the Liberty was able to patch through a, uh, a call when they were under uh, air, air attack. One of the radio operators was able to patch uh, a, an antenna coax to one of their undamaged antennas. And uh, they sent out a distress call saying that they were under attack by unidentified aircraft. And well, now, see, see, now, the unidentified aircraft, did, did, they, did they say how many of them and what was the, 
what was the configuration of this assault. Uh, they had they had um, they had aircraft uh, of different types attacking, including uh, helicopter uh, airships too, didn't they? Yes, they did. Uh, the the first wave of the first wave of the attack, the type of aircraft it was used was the uh, Dassault Mirage. It was a French-built aircraft, a Mach, Mach 2 aircraft, which was really high-tech compared to what the Liberty had for defense. All the Liberty had for defenses was four 50-caliber Browning machine gun mounts, two up forward and two up behind the bridge, up above. No ASROC, no anything, right? No, nothing. And well, was, see, it, was, so now, it, was like, it was like pea shooters, as the guys described it. Well, now, now were we flying our colors that day? We sure were. As, as all American ships do when they're steaming under power. That's right. And, and, uh, and, and so on the fantail, we had a, we had an American flag that was big enough to be seen, seen from probably many miles away, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Actually, the flag was fla flying from, from the main mast ab uh, above and behind the bridge, much higher. Much higher. Okay. Yes, sir. So there, so there was no way that anybody, uh, flying around that ship could mistake it as a, uh, as an enemy, uh, uh vessel. Were you within sight distance of the Saratoga? Yes, we were. We were steaming on a parallel course in, in, in our operations out there, and uh, we were approximately, oh, I'd say maybe three or four miles apart, you know, steaming in a parallel course. Yeah, a six or eight uh, group, uh, battle group? Yeah, six or eight with, ships. yeah, with destroyers, escorts, cruisers, cruisers, yeah. those little rock, yes. So, and now, so what we've got here... We've got all of these cruisers and everybody around. We've got the jets. They, were, were they were they given orders to fly off the decks, or were they were they were they told to stand down? What was the what was the procedure that that happened once they received these uh, these calls for help? Well, we're hearing more. We hear more about what happened, uh, amazingly enough, uh, on the Saratoga than anything that that took place aboard the America. And uh, being which one was the flagship on the, on that day? Uh, <sighs> The flagship, yeah. I believe, was the Little Rock. The Little Rock was? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Admiral Geist did spend some time on the America. Um, he frequently, frequently was there, and he held, uh, he held news conferences. Since, since the America was the news pool, America served as a news pool. We had about 30 journalists on board from API, you know, AP, UPI, uh, London Times, uh, Detroit News, you name it, they were there. I now, why were they all there? They were there to, um, well, it's kind of like uh, the, the military uh, was doing in, you know, in the, uh, in, in, the, in the Gulf War and uh, in Grenada. They had a news pool, you know, where they kind of had control over all the media. Yes. They'd bring them all together and they'd feed them the information. Well, that's apparently what, what was going on in America. America was selected as a ship, probably because of, you know, America's namesake. And that's where they, they put the reporters. Right. I didn't find out until years later, by the way, from Jim Ennis that he told me that the reporters on the America were rounded up that day of the attack on the Liberty. They were rounded up by the ship's mastered armed force and Marines and put into a locked compartment under Marine Guard. Holy Moses. Yes, sir. Really. I didn't even know that. I mean, there's a lot of things that can happen on a ship where you're working two ships and there's about, you know, 4,000 men. Well, I know, plus the, uh, plus the, uh, the, the Airedales and the rest of them, we had about 5,000 when I was on board. But listen, so so we so now we we end up we end up starting to sh to shoot off some uh, some birds off the deck, right? We started we lit off some flights. I will. Uh, but what happened? Tell I me, will, did you? I'll tell you what I what I know, and that's uh, pretty much uh, stated in Jim's book was that uh, Captain Tully Tully said he got the word from his communications officer. He came up to the bridge, came up under the bridge, and informed Captain Tully, the skipper of the USS Saratoga, that they received a message um, from. Um, I guess it was Rockstar was the code, code name of the Liberty. And, uh, you know, when you get these messages, they got to get a confirmation that, that, that this is real, that the real party is calling, you know, and so on and so forth, that they need confirmation. And uh, when they did get confirmation, uh, in fact, one of the Liberty crewmen holds, holds, the, uh, holds the radio phone outside, you know, so that they can hear the jets roaring over them, making passes and firing at them. Is that confirmation enough for you? <laughs> and so Captain Tully uh, assembled a strike group of about 12 aircraft, including in-flight refueling tankers, so that they'd have enough fuel to get to their destination uh, in, in the air over the Liberty. And he Liberty, and he launched the aircraft without without any hesitation. Yep. This is an American ship under fire, under an attack. And I guess you you're probably well aware that one of the worst crimes that can be committed in the military is for one unit not to come to the aid of another. That's right. 
That's so right. uh, Captain Tully launched his aircraft, and uh, apparently before they got uh, out of sight over the horizon, they were recalled by Washington. They got orders from uh, Washington, McNamara, Johnson, whatever, saying to get those aircraft back on deck and get them back now. And then now, they um, now this is this is a this is a crime. Uh, this is treason. Some people would interpret would interpret it that way. To interpret it, there's nothing to interpret. That's treason. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a treasonous act. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so now we know that, the, that that somebody in Washington committed treason, and the simple truth is is that they allowed this this ship to uh, try to weather an assault from the Israelis. The Liberty, the Liberty managed to get out their distress call during the air attack. Uh, the first stage of the attack was carried out by the, uh, the by the Mach 2 Dassault Mirage aircraft. Nobody, uh, the crew members aren't sure how many there were. Some estimates maybe three to a half a dozen, possibly if that many, half a dozen. But uh, in the confusion uh, and, and the rain of, of hell that they were undergoing, you know, with cannon fire and uh, armor-piercing rockets. Uh, it was really, it was really hard to tell because most of the time they were undercover. And these yep. rockets were piercing bulkheads and going through decks and you, you know what that's like aboard ship. I mean, you think you got some protection from the steel, but you don't. You don't, no. No, no not unless you're in an area of double plating and that's yeah. not very, that's not very, uh, very, most of the ship has no double plating. Yeah, they weren't below the water line on the battleship. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Uh, so these rockets were pierce, pierce, going through the, clear through the ship in some instances, and uh, so the second stage of the attack was uh, carried out by Mystere, slower, uh, slower attack bombers carrying napalm, and uh, some, some descriptions say fragmentary or anti-personnel bombs or whatever. I mean, they really did a job on the ship. Basically, if you look at the whole picture, the assault from, from the way Jim describes it in his book came in three stages. First, the air attack, which lasted for approximately a half hour. When the air attack uh, broke off, I guess they expended their weapons, um, munitions. The, uh, the bridge got word from the, um, from the people that were watching the radar below decks saying that they had three surface targets approaching them at high speed at approximately 30 knots. So they had gunboats coming then, and they were they were high speed or Israeli motor torpedo boats. Well, now so, so now we, we've got how, how are they weathering this kind of assault? Now we've got the we've got the the, the uh, torpedo boats coming in. What did they do? They unload their torpedoes into the side they of the ship. Fired, they fired an S, anywhere from three to five or six torpedoes. Um, descriptions from people that were on deck said one of the guys, I think it was Phil Turney, said he watched one pass right underneath the bow. The, uh, when, when the, when the motor torpedo boats, uh, uh, fired their torpedoes, they continued to circle the ship and fired at, fired at, uh, firefighting crews that were fighting fires on the decks of the Liberty. They fired at stretcher bearers. They even fired at, uh, at the, at the life rafts when, when the, when the, uh, when the captain of the ship, Captain McGonagall, gave the order to prepare to abandon ship. They brought the wounded up from the spaces below. They had been using the, uh, the, the, mess, the enlisted Mestex area as a, as, a, as a treatment area for all the wounded. And so they started bringing up the wounded from below uh, to prepare them to um, um, evacuate the ship. And so the life rafts were put over the side, and according to the guys that were on, on, on deck that were able to get their heads out far enough to see, you know, he said the Israelis shot up their life rafts. So that, that to them indicated that they, the, the, their attackers intended for there to be no survivors. Well, you know, the, the, we're, we're talking about some of the worst criminals on our planet, and they still are doing that. They murdered our 9-11 um, people in those buildings as well, uh, and we'll talk about that privately as well as on the air some other time, Wayne. But, okay, so, so what else happened? What happened next? 
Um, after the uh, a- after the motor torpedo boats had uh, well, they came, actually they came in close enough. One of the torpedo boats came in close enough uh, that a crewman actually stood up on the bow of the boat with a boat hook and fished one of the Liberty's uh, inflatable life rafts out of the water and and hauled it aboard, and then they, the torpedo boats left the scene. A little while later, they were approached by two large troop-carrying helicopters, assault helicopters that were carrying, that were loaded with fully armed assault troops. Mm-hmm. And uh, they, uh, the captain gave the order to uh, to all arms to the crew members to prepare to repel boarders, just like in the old days, you know, when they you built sailing ships. They opened up the armory and got small arms out. Yes, yes, I think they did, and they were pre- they were prepared to. Uh, Fight these guys off. They looked at them as coming in to finish the job, storm the ship, machine gun the survivors, and uh, plant C4 charges on the on board and put them down. Yeah. But they they didn't. They they sort of feigned uh, assistance, you know, hanging around up uh, standing off to the side of the ship forward of the bridge, and um, they they knew that they knew that, or they knew because they were monitoring six fleet radio traffic that rescue aircraft were on the way or were supposedly on their way. Had they known they weren't, had they known they were recalled, they probably would have finished the job, and this whole thing would have had a different turnout. Yep. Here's the history that, I, as I see it, uh, we were we were viciously and intentionally attacked uh, by Israel uh, in 1967 uh, in a pretext to start a war that where we would use our navy and our military to attack Egypt, who was at the time a Soviet state. Uh, satellite, and uh, in fact, our own government committed uh, a terrible act of treason by not allowing aid to go to the sailors of the USS Liberty. Uh, we had many lost, many lost lives, and uh, many people still today are alive with uh, with with life uh, lifetime injuries. We have a caller, uh, uh, Wayne. We're going to take if that's okay with you. Great, uh, uh, Mike from Arizona. You're on, my friend. Yeah, hi, uh, Daryl. Hi. Let's see how long my voice holds out. Uh, just a comment. You'd mentioned or uh, referred to Israel or uh, Egypt as a client state of uh, Russia. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I'm about the same age as you, a little a few years older. Uh, but uh, I remember those years when when we were uh, all conned with the notion that the the Arab states were were uh, pawns in the hands of the Soviet Union. Right. And basically, they were just kind of satellite uh, satellites of, of um, communist Russia. And in fact, it, it was just the opposite. That's right. Uh, you know, the the uh, Israel from its earliest days had the uh, uh, Meyer Kaganovich Pact. Uh, my ear, I should pronounce it, uh, as in Golda My Ear uh, Kaganovich. That was Stalin's right hand man, and uh, basically that. That ensured that uh, uh, Russia, the use of Israel, the use of their bases, that they would share intelligence, uh, that uh, that the official Communist Party would be allowed to operate within uh, within Israel, and uh, uh, so these these people were from the early days thick as thieves. Yeah. And, and the the Soviet Union basically just uh, these people were the pawns of the, the Zionist slash Bolsheviks. I mean, there's, there's two arms of the same operation. That's right. Uh, you know, the uh, the the uh, Soviets would would provide just enough weapons to the to the, the poor hapless uh, Arabs that they could get themselves in trouble, uh, but but not, never win a war with with Israel or or with any country with with first rate armament. Well, we need no more evidence than to know that uh, that uh, the Ro- that Rockefeller and uh, and the rest of the Goldmans and Khan and the rest in the United States were sending armed hammer over to Russia regularly uh, as a as a courier for the political activities. We were not at, at enemies with Russia at the time. We were running this, this uh, Hegelian dialectic.
we are back. We are back. We are back. Daryl Bradford Smith, French Connection. Great to have you with me here on this Thursday. It is a uh, a great day for truth telling, ladies and gentlemen. And boy, are we going to tell you some uh, some some truth right now with uh, with my guest and uh, and I hope soon to be calling uh, calling him friend. Uh, his uh, Lieutenant Commander Jim Ennis. Jim, are you with me? I am with you, Daryl. Well, we're gonna we're gonna tell some truth today, Jim. You know, uh, back in, in back in in, uh, in what in sixty uh, sixty four you went into the military. Is that that correct? Uh, actually, I first went into the Navy in in fifty one, but I was commissioned in sixty two, and this event occurred in sixty seven. That's right. And uh, and at the time of this incident, and let's set this, uh, the stage for this. You were on a, an information gathering ship called the USS Liberty. And it was about just past the international waters line off the coast of uh, Israel between, uh, where exactly? Off the Sinai, uh, between Egypt and Israel? Where, where exactly was the uh, Liberty? Uh, exactly. We were about 13 miles off the coast, just out of the claimed international waters, and uh, near the town of El Arish, uh, between Egypt and Israel. Okay. And, and so on this... On this day, uh, and, and what day was it? What day was it? What part of the year was it exactly, Jim? This was June 8, 1967. Okay, and, and you were officer of the deck uh, just prior to this incident, and if anybody doesn't know what that means, is, is for all intents and purposes, you were in charge of the, of the ship for that time while the captain was either in his ready room or wherever else. Is that correct also? That's right. Yeah, the captain usually wanders around the ship and takes care of his own business and... and uh, leaves the management of the ship and the navigation and so forth to an officer on the bridge. And this day, that was me. Well, now, so now, and, and the, the closest next ship to you or was a task force, uh, including the USS America and the Saratoga. How far away from you were these two ships? We were a good, good 300 miles, maybe 350. Mm -hmm. And so you were there pretty much alone, and you were there on an information gathering mission uh, because there was a lot of tension uh, erupting in uh, Israel in 1967 between Egypt, Israel, Jordan, and Syria, was there not? That's right. It, I mean, it was obvious to anybody reading newspapers that the area was uh, close to erupting in war. So we were out there to keep an eye on that and, uh, incidentally, at the same time, to keep an eye on the Soviets in uh, Egypt. And so there, there was a lot of reasons why, and, and, and you know, this was under Nasser, I believe, was was the leader of of, uh, of Egypt at that time, wasn't he? That's right. Yeah. And so now, what, what we ended up having is that uh, all of a sudden you saw a, a, a couple of jets starting to do observational flyovers, didn't you? That's right. Uh, I I took the watch at seven fifteen in the morning, and I was uh, officer of the deck from seven fifteen until almost twelve o'clock. Uh, and moments after I took the watch, uh, a single jet uh, passed by the ship, uh, fairly low, uh, maybe uh, a thousand feet or so above us. Uh, and we didn't think a lot of it. I mean, here uh, it was obviously an Israeli sh uh, airplane, and we expected to be watched closely. Uh, they went by, and uh, then a few minutes later, the senior intercept operator down below, Chief Melvin Smith, who died in the attack, uh, came up the bridge, and he asked me, he said, were you just circled by a, an airplane, an Israeli airplane? I said, I was. And he said, well, uh, we picked up their communications. They, they know we're American, and uh, they reported so to their headquarters. And now they were they were flying the uh, f a very advanced French Mirage, weren't they? That's right. Yeah. And at the time, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, the Mirage was one of the world's uh, best uh, fighter jets, wasn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. So now, so now, we, we, how long did this, this these flyovers continue? Well, initially there was that one, and then uh, an hour or so later uh, there was another, and then uh, during the morning there were uh, eight separate. Incidents, uh, the, most of which I saw, in which they circled sometimes as low as 200 feet directly overhead. Uh, sometimes they passed so close overhead that they actually rattled the deck plating. Now that's low. Yeah, uh, that's sure. Sometimes there were jets. Sometimes they were uh, a big twin-engine uh, Nord Norat. We call a flying box car. Yeah, I, I know. The, I know the aircraft. 
and and so now what was happening here? Okay, uh, you, you you your colors were flying. You you had them on the main mast. Where where were you, where were your colors at that at that particular time? They were flying from the main mast. So uh, and, and clear to see and from any anybody. In fact, from a thousand feet, you could see the American colors. I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. In fact, my orders to the uh, lookouts on the bridge and the quartermasters were to keep an eye on that flag, and if it ever wraps around the mast, as they sometimes do, uh, be sure it is immediately straightened out and, and just flying freely. Mm-hmm. And also, uh, almost as soon as I took the watch, uh, I saw that the flag we were flying, which was which we had flown all the way across the Mediterranean for the previous week, was uh, dirty from uh, from soot, and I ordered that replaced with a new flag. So we had clean, new, bright colors flying uh, all morning before the attack, easily easily seen. Now, so 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 as this as this stuff developed, uh, Jim, uh, when did you when did you become aware that there was an aggressive nature to these flights? Uh, actually, we were pretty well convinced that their looking us over so closely was the best thing that could happen to us because uh, uh, they were supposed to be our friends, and uh, obviously if they identified us, which we knew they had, we were safe. And so we had a, uh, a general quarters drill at 1 o'clock, uh, I came back on the bridge as officer, or conning officer at least, for the uh, for that period from 1 to 2 o'clock. And uh, just as that drill was ending at 2 o'clock and I was transferring the con back to another officer, uh, we the, the, the radar men picked up on radar three high-speed uh, surface craft approaching the ship at about 16 miles away, just coming over the horizon. You can... You can see from our uh, 50 feet or so above the water, you can just about see uh, 16 miles. And at that point here, there are these uh, boats coming over the horizon. Now, we still, uh, we they were coming from the direction of Tel Aviv, Israel. And uh, we thought, hey, that's good. They're coming out to visit us. In fact, the captain had been saying all day they're going to come out by boats early this afternoon and take a look at us. And sure enough, here they were. I switched my glance to dead ahead, and the airplane there uh, suddenly uh, erupted into uh, yellow flames under under both wings uh, as it fired a barrage of, of missiles at us. And uh, we had men in two gun mounts on the ship's forecastle. And uh, they were immediately hit by missiles that blew six, eight-inch holes in the in the railing around their gun tubs. I saw them go, uh, the men just end over end into the air. Uh, everybody on open decks dropped. There must have been close to a dozen men around me that came up to see these airplanes. And uh, they all dropped. Uh, Chuck... The only reason he didn't get shrapnel in his eye is that it came, piece came right down the barrel, the, the long barrel of the um, camera he was looking through. Uh, I turned my left side to the heat, which was the first thing I felt, and I was raked with about 50 pieces of shrapnel, uh, one of which broke my left leg. Uh, remarkably, I, it threw me uh, four or five feet against another railing, uh, and I was left standing on my one good leg with my broken leg uh, you know, bent just above the knee. Mm-hmm. And uh, all these guys around me uh, trying to get up and couldn't, and I wasn't in any condition to help anybody. So uh, I hopped down the ladder into the pilot house and uh, uh, just as the second plane arrived. And that went on for 20 or 25 minutes, just... Uh, uh, jet after jet after jet firing, uh, cannon and missiles. And when the Mirages got through with us, uh, then there was a squadron of, uh, Mysteers that, uh, carried napalm. And, and, they, and, and they, and they, they actually, they, they did an, uh, an air blast of napalm just above the ship? 
No, the uh, the napalm canisters hit the ship and sloshed in through the missile holes that had just been made by the by the rockets. Oh man! And and so and so, what spaces were hit? Uh, what what uh, you know? What were the what what areas of the ship were hit by by the napalm and and, and uh, what holes? What parts of the what parts of the ship were actually laid open? Uh, mostly on either side of the bridge, the around the uh, the motor whale boats and the uh, and on the port side of the ship, we had uh, two fifty gallon or fifty five gallon gasoline drums in a, an emergency release rack. Uh, they were uh, also uh, cut open by the missiles, and so we had one hundred ten gallons of gasoline. Sloshing around, pouring down ladders that got, got set afire by the napalm, and uh, so the whole port side of the ship was uh, was a, a solid blaze. Was the captain able to call a, a fire brigades for this, or were you? Did you just keep watertight integrity? What did you do? Uh, he called away the fire party, and people tried to people tried to fight it. There wasn't much really that they could do it. Uh, uh, because the water, of course, wasn't very effective, and and they were being shot at all this time. Uh, what many of the men did, which which was most effective, was to grab some of the CO2 tanks, uh, turn them on, and just toss the whole tank into the blaze. Okay. So that that worked pretty well, but this uh, you guys up. didn't have PKP and the rest of it on uh, at that time. Probably, I I remember the PK foam and all that, but. Yeah. So now, so now you're 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 into this battle already. And are you able to? Um, I mean, what's the captain's orders at this point? I mean, is he is he telling people to get back to the to the folks of Torrance and, and and start firing at them? Or I mean, were you able to even get a shot off against them? Uh, were you able to communicate with uh, with the with the far, with the uh, Saratoga and the America? What was going on at this point that you know of? Well, we had some. Four fifty caliber machine guns, and some of those uh, got off some rounds, so not very effectively. I mean, this is a, this is supposed to be a friend of ours, a nation that's a friend of ours. Clearly, that day, Commander, were they our friends? Clearly not. Clearly not. And so, uh, what, what happened next? I mean, I know you, you were terribly injured. You were pro- uh, you had a lot of shipmates that were injured. There was uh, there was uh, fires uh, uh, raging. W- what did you do next? Well, I uh, made it down. I was hopped on one leg part of the way and was carried in a gurney the rest of the way down to the main deck on a uh, in an interior passageway while the attack continued. Uh, and meanwhile, the torpedo boats uh, came in uh, closer. They got about a thousand yards away and launched five torpedoes at us. Uh, one of which hit the ship. Fortunately, the other four missed, but one hit the ship and blew a 40-foot hole in the side, killed 25 more men. Nine had been killed by the air attack. Uh, and it, 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 there the story really gets twisted because uh, Israel, when they uh, apologized to the United States for this thing, they said that, uh, at that point, they uh, recognized this as American and, and uh, apologized and offered to help. And that is the biggest bald-faced lie in the history of the world. Uh, they didn't offer help for nearly an hour and a half. Uh, what they did was get closer, examine our flag and our markings in English from 50 feet away, uh, circled us close, uh, 50 or 100 feet away from the ship while machine gunning anything that moved. They were machine gunning the firefighters, the stretcher bearers. Uh, it was obvious to them that, that we're an American ship. We had a huge American flag. Meanwhile, incidentally, that original flag had been shot down twice, and we replaced it with an oversized flag. It was about 12 feet long. Uh, there was no question that they could see our flag. Now, were they marked? Did you see markings on their on their boats and on the on, on the mirages that were passing over? Uh, no, nobody saw any markings on those things.
uh, you you attempted, uh, not, maybe not you personally, but uh, but Pete, your shipmates uh, tried to communicate uh, this attack, and they were being jammed, weren't they? Uh, yes. As soon as the attack started, we we uh, started radioing to uh, Six Fleet. Uh, and USS America and, and other American forces that we were under attack and needed immediate assistance. Of course, that's one of the remarkable things about this whole business. We immediately got a reply back from the USS America, uh, excuse me, Saratoga, which was with USS America, uh, 300 miles away, and they assured us help is on the way, and they started launching airplanes. And uh, for reasons that we have never been able to figure out, the White House uh, immediately ordered those airplanes recalled. So uh, I've talked to several of the pilots that were on their way to help us uh, when they got orders uh, to return to the ship. And they knew that, that, that our ship was still under attack, but uh, they had to turn around and, and abandon us. Uh, Captain Tully of the, of the Saratoga told me that uh, he could hear, he, he was connected by radio with our radio man, and the radio was patched up to the bridge. He could hear, uh, the radio man calling for help and, and, uh, missiles, rockets exploding in the background. And, uh, still the airplanes that he had sent to help us were ordered to abandon us. Uh, apparently, they didn't know if those uh, airplanes had been recalled or not. So, they th did they continue their their attack after uh, the Saratoga informed you that they were sending uh, aircraft, or was their attack uh, curtailed at that point? I mean, how did they? St when did they stop? And, and, and in your estimation, why did they stop? Uh, they appear to have stopped only because they heard our call for help get out, and the uh, American Saratoga tell us that help was on the way. And they had no way of knowing that help was not really on the way. Well, then that's what saved the day. Now, uh, right. when when these guys uh, did did they return to their bases and leave you guys just floating there to to try and, and put yourselves back together, or or um, did they stay in the vicinity while uh, while they they did they move off uh, to the distance, or did they go all the way back to their base? Well, to get the picture, the attack started at two o'clock. Yeah. At uh, the, the, at three fifteen, they were still circling us, taking occasional pot shots at whatever moved, uh, and we were taking on more and more water. And we had a heavy list. We had a forty foot hole in the side, and uh, the captain ordered prepare to abandon ship. So uh, we launched uh, three life rafts over the side. We're the only ones that would uh, that would stay afloat. Uh, they machine gun the life rafts in the water, which is a war crime by any estimation. Yeah. Uh, took one of them aboard, and at that point, uh, 3.15, 75 minutes after it all started, they took that life raft aboard and headed back toward Tel Aviv. So, so now you, you, um, you, you, I would have imagined that you stayed in general court, so you were, you were maintaining watertight integrity. So, uh, so your ship was only listing and not sinking. Luckily, yes. Uh, oh. Fortunately, the uh, the torpedo hit the intelligence spaces, which were sealed off from other parts of the ship. So there there were no watertight doors on that level between the flooded space and the next space. So uh, uh, we had even that much more protection. Well, that's that's fortunate uh, of design. And when you did your assessment, how many? How many people ultimately were were were, were killed on that in, in that first instance? Uh, nine died from the air attack. Twenty five more died from the uh, from the torpedo, and uh, ultimately one hundred and ninety uh, one hundred and seventy four of the two hundred and ninety seven or so man crew uh, were wounded. So now, once you limped, where, what happened? Now, did you? Was the captain uh, um, still intact? Was he still in command? Or was he injured? What was up with the captain? Uh, he was injured. He lost a lot of blood. Uh, and he stayed on his feet throughout the attack and eventually uh, just uh, lay down on deck on the on the wing of the bridge and continued to give orders from, from that position. Uh, he stayed on the bridge all night long. 
Um, meanwhile, uh, we were getting, uh, we were establishing communications with, uh, with the rest of the Navy, and almost the first thing we received was uh, information telling us that um, this was not to be talked about. Uh, it was it was amazing how the uh, the whole thing was controlled. Uh, we Admiral Kidd uh, was Admiral was, Kidd the, the task force the commander. Pardon? Was Admiral Kidd your task force commander? No, he was a rear admiral that was uh, on another command in the Mediterranean, and he was. Uh, brought out simply to hold the court of inquiry under the direction of Admiral McCain, who was the uh, chief and staff, or commander in chief of naval forces Europe. And that would be the John uh, McCain uh, Senior, uh, the uh, father of John McCain, uh, the United States Senator. Am I correct? Exactly, and that appears to be one reason we have gotten nothing but a cold shoulder from John McCain Jr. He just won't talk to us about this. Yeah, well, there are other reasons that I've shared with you, and I'm going to share with my listeners as well why this man has done such a thing. You were immediately aware that they wanted to squash this story, uh, and uh, and then you, did you receive uh, any visits from uh, from from uh, Admiral Kidd? Uh, oh, yeah, the ship did. Uh, Admiral Kidd boarded the ship at sea uh, on uh, en route to Malta in the middle of the night, and then stayed aboard for several days while he held the court of inquiry. Uh, meanwhile, a uh, point that's worth noting is that Israel uh, immediately sent the United States a um, an apology of sorts uh, for the attack. Uh, it's interesting that the torpedo boats were told by radio uh, immediately after the attack uh, to go back there after they were we realized who it was. They were told to return to the ship and offer help, but do not apologize. So they didn't apologize. They came alongside and they said, do you need help? Uh, then the, uh, the the Israelis, within hours and uh, a couple more times in the next few days, prepared ever more elaborate excuses for what it was. And they, uh, they came up with a, a totally false story of what happened that we have been trying to correct ever since. Uh, they told the United States, and, and this uh, is all on my website, USSLiberty.org, uh, they reported to the United States that uh, they spotted this uh, ship, which they thought was Egyptian, uh, near the coast where they claimed someone was firing on the coast, so we must have been uh, an enemy. Nobody was firing on the coast. Uh, they said that they measured our speed and determined we were moving at 30 knots, so we must be a warship. Our top speed was about 18 knots with the governors off. Yeah, that, that's that's full. That's full. Uh, that's full forward. That's nothing. You get you no way. Not a yeah. chance at 30. Uh, that's right. But they, <laughs> they, they claimed they thought we were going 30, so we had to be an enemy. Uh, that they uh, tried to catch us, but we were going too fast. You know, here we were, 18 knots stop speed. We're actually moving five knots, uh, but they claimed they couldn't catch us, so they called in the aircraft. Uh, then they thought we were an Egyptian uh, cattle boat called. It was really an Egyptian uh, horse transport called El Quasar, and uh, they looked us up in Jane's and identified us as. El Quasar, because they say we looked something like that. We didn't look anything like that. Uh, then they say they uh, fired a torpedo, but what do you know? As soon as the torpedo hit the water, they say, oh, it's an American ship. There's a flag. And so uh, they stopped firing and uh, immediately came alongside and offered help. Well, that didn't happen either. They continued firing for another 40 minutes after that torpedo explosion uh, from close range, and we've been telling our own government ever since that, hey, they didn't stop firing at 235 after the torpedo. They machine gun our life rafts at 315 and then left. But uh, nobody will listen to us. The Congress won't even take our testimony. Commander, Commander, I'm listening, and so are a lot of people right now are listening. And uh, and more and more than ten or 15,000 people will hear this story 
soon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, what we're going to move to now is uh, the next level of this deception. Uh, Admiral Kidd, from what I understand, actually uh, removed his uh, his brass and uh, and his his insignias and everything and stood in front of everybody uh, kind of off the record and told everybody that this was not to be shared uh, outside of that group uh, with anybody. Is that not true, or did I hear wrong? No, that's totally true. In fact, that was his custom to establish a little closer rapport, I guess, with the uh, uh, with the men in the Navy. He would frequently uh, remove his stars and sit down and say, hey, uh, my stars are off. I'm just one of the guys. Tell me what really happened. So he gathered together a dozen or so at a time of our of our people cars off. Well, uh, here's the crazy. thing. You know, here's the thing. He knew what happened was was uh, was a. He knows what they said was a lie, and he he covered up a lie. So the orders were to cover it up. Yeah, that's right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, when we come back, we've got more to the story. You you don't go anywhere. That this this French connection is really connecting the dots today. Be right back. But anyway, let's move on to to, to another subject here. Uh, when this, um, when this, when you guys disbanded as a as ship's company, in other words, you you're in launch duel. You've got you, you. Did the XO survive, or, or did he die in the attack? Your XO. He died uh, three or four hours after the attack. So you've got you've lost your XO. You've got an injured captain. He's he's in a hospital. I mean, everybody's getting all fanned out everywhere. Uh, they did they send a message to you at launch duel to keep your mouth shut about what happened? Uh. I, the first message I got was after I got back to uh, the Naval Hospital in Virginia, I had a visit from a Navy captain who told me that if I ever talked about this, I would go to jail. Uh, in fact, just all the, all the men who stayed aboard were told by Admiral Kidd uh, in these little group sessions, he'd take his stars off, then he'd put his stars back on, and he'd say, okay, uh, if you ever repeat the stories you have just told me, you will go to jail forever, and we'll throw away the key. Uh, men who were uh, transferred to hospitals had similar visits, usually from Navy captains who came out and gave them the same message as they did me. That was treason. Yep. of the investigation of the Levon affair and subsequent uh, uh, non-reporting of that event and, and the USS Liberty event? Oh, absolutely. I, in fact, my, the first draft of my book had a chapter on the Levon affair because I thought they were perfect parallels and that uh, where somebody says, hey, that couldn't be true about the Liberty, you, you just go back and point to the Levon affair and here's a, a mirror image of the same thing. Well, here's the next question. There, there were, in hindsight, you've you've come to understand that they were actually doing some 
some uh, some rather heinous things in that desert uh, against uh, prisoners of war, which is what has come to light over the last a few years. You want to describe uh, what what kinds of things that you were you were intercepting at that time? You were there were some uh, hinting of of a disposal of of uh, war prisoners of war, wasn't there? Uh, there was the Israelis had captured uh, several hundred, perhaps as many as a thousand Egyptian prisoners of war uh, who were being held near the town of El Arish. Now we were we passed 12 miles off the coast of El Arish. So I think around 10 o'clock that morning, and little did we know, but it happens that uh, they were uh, lining up these prisoners, requiring them to dig their own graves in the desert sand, and then they'd jump in, and, and they uh, the Israelis would machine gun them, and then the next few prisoners would uh, fill a hole in and dig their own. Uh, it's funny that some of the Israelis claim that that never happened. If it happened, it would have been in all the newspapers. Well, it was in all the newspapers, mm -hmm. uh, or at least it was in Time Magazine and U.S. News and World Report, and it's been uh, that story has been verified by a number of senior Israeli military officers and reporters. Well, so so essentially, it's it's quite possible they believed you to have. Maybe some some uh, you know red-handed type of uh, information on their war crimes, on their uh, on their murder spree in that desert, and possibly uh, that was a precipitating factor, possibly in their in their attack. Is that something that that sounds rational to you? Uh, that's right. I mean, we they didn't know exactly what we were doing, but we were an intelligence ship. They knew we were an intelligence ship, and we were in an area where we were. Uh, we should have been able to detect those things that they didn't want us to know. So yep. uh, it appears that that's why they attacked us. Well, here's a, here's the next uh, a couple of questions that I've got. You know, this is this is 1967, and um, most of the crew ha ha is is quite uh, um, on in, in years, and uh, and many people have wondered why uh, there has never been justice or or truth brought out about this. And you've been fighting this fight for decades, Jim, along with many of your shipmates and many people that were uh, sent to help you that day, including uh, Wayne Kyle and many others in the in the USS Liberty Association. Uh, every everything we say is provable, verifiable, and in fact supported by uh, the heads of all the U.S. intelligence agencies, uh, CIA director, NSA, the the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Secretary of State, and their deputies. I mean, all of these, nobody quarrels with the facts of what we say. The attack was uh, prolonged, deliberate. Uh, they knew us to be American. Uh, but all they have to do is say, well, that's an anti-Semite. Only anti-Semites tell that story. They, they say it because they hate Israel, which is nonsense. Uh, and that shuts everybody up. Is the money we send to Israel mm -hmm. that they send back to buy off our politicians with our money? Bingo, 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 bingo. And by the way, you know we they give they give fifty times more money to Israel every year than they give to the state of Massachusetts. And now listen to this. Israel has 4 million people. The state of Massachusetts has 8 million. And they get 50 times the amount of money. You figure it out. Well, we've got, we've got a Congress bought and paid for, ladies and gentlemen. Bought and paid for. ...over the American government. And do you have any uh, idea how the Mossad works with, within the APEC and the rest of these organizations? I tell you the truth. Such a question a bit embarrasses me. Uh, because, you know, I'm supposed, when I'm in an interview, I'm supposed to say new things. And actually, if you read the Israeli media in Hebrew, it's all over the place. All over the, all over the newspapers, you can read there how, the, how Israel, through, through local communities in the United States, plays both sides of the game and gives donations to, poli to political people in both parties, in both main parties in the, in the United States, so that these people depend 
on Jewish Israeli donations for their campaigns. It's yeah. all over the Israeli media. You see that all the time. Yeah. Uh, Jerusalem certainly influences what's going on. Uh, I mean, one issue, for instance, is our war crime report. Uh, there is an absolute requirement of the government by American law and by international treaty that if a, an individual makes a, a, a report of war crime, the government has to investigate. Yep. There's no way around it. The Secretary of the Army is the uh, agent for investigating war crimes. Uh, we reported years ago that the Israeli attack on our ship was a war crime, and they just lost, laughed us off, uh, refusing to investigate. Uh, a year ago, an attorney who is uh, an experienced prosecutor and, and uh, well familiar with these things, and who, in fact, was... Uh, Rather closely connected with the with the attack at the time, uh, Ron Gotcher in the Los Angeles and South, yep. Southern California, yep. created a with attachments over a 300 page very detailed report uh, uh, documenting point by point that the attack on our ship was a war crime. Yeah, uh, for several reasons. Uh, we filed that with the Secretary of the Army in the prescribed manner on June 8, 2005, and we're still waiting for them to acknowledge it. Now, that that war crime report has sworn affidavits in it by such people as uh, retired Rear Admiral Merlin Starring, a former uh, judge advocate, general, chief judge advocate general of the Navy. Yep. And here's a senior lawyer in the Navy. Mm -hmm. uh, he supports, helped prepare the war crime report. He signed an affidavit in which he reported from his own personal experience that uh, the official Navy investigation of the attack was a fraud. Right. Uh, he then personally delivered that report to the Secretary of the Army. Now, uh, you, you told me that you, it's a fraud from the beginning, and we had we had two high-level admirals at the time, Admiral Kidd and Admiral McCain, uh, both very, very active in, in the original uh, quieting and then silencing of any uh, protest that came out of this. Am I right in that uh, assertion? Oh, that's right, yeah. Now, it's the same McCain that we have now as a senator, his father. That's right. The father of Senator McCain w w was a four-star admiral who, in fact, called, uh, ordered that the investigation be held.